Today's reading <clears throat> will be taken from the NIV, and it will be taken from Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 28. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my presence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, conducting as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. Good morning. Uh, I have a question to start with. Um, what do you like best about living in Canada? Oh, okay. You guys, you guys are actually participating. This is good. You know, there was a study that was done in 2017. That was, if you can remember, that year was the 150th anniversary or birthday of Canada. There was a study that was done in relation to that question and see if your answers match up to some of the results of that survey. Okay. So um, I was going to put an article in there that showed that. And uh, this article from newswire.ca had eight things. Actually, I'm going to go there right now. Um, eight things that respondents said they loved about Canada. And the top three that they said, there's eight, but the top three is this, healthcare. Okay, some of you guys said healthcare. That's, I believe that was 55% of respondents, respondents said healthcare. Number two was uh, the national parks of Canada, the nature in Canada. And number three was um, Canadian politeness. I mean, I was, the, you know, the first time I came to Canada, that was, that was uh, 25 years ago in, in 1994. Or 1990, 1994, yeah. I was looking at Doug here because he could tell me. 1994, uh, that's the first thing that I noticed about Canada is the Canadian politeness. I mean, people were opening doors for me. I'd say, I, I said thanks to them. I, I opened doors for them and they say thanks to me. It's, it's amazing. And then to top off, the rest of the, of the results was cultural diversity, abundant natural resources, Canadian foods, including maple, uh, maple syrup and poutine. I know it's a thing. Uh, hockey and Canadian weather. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm from, I'm from a tropical country. I was born and raised in the Philippines, and I love the, the, the weather in Canada. Four seasons. I will trade winter for humidity. Uh, no, sorry, I, 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 will want, I, will, I don't know if I said that right, but I would want winter over humidity all year round. I don't like humid. It's too hot. I know there's such a thing as too hot. So um, we enjoy so many things here in Canada. A lot of things that we enjoy in Canada. There's a lot of things that we love about Canada. But the, the question that I have for you here is this. Are you fulfilled? Are you happy here in Canada? right? We all are. But uh, there is, remember in my last sermon, I put up uh, 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 a slide that's John 10, verse 10. You guys remember that verse? John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus himself says this, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Are we living that full life today? I know we live in Canada and all, but is that enough to say, well, I'm fulfilled. I'm done. I can die tomorrow right? What I'm going to do today for the few minutes that we have left is this. I would like to, to give an answer to that question today. How do we live a full life? How do we, do we, do we have a life that corresponds to the desire of Jesus coming here? Because he wants to give us that full life. How do we do that? This morning, I would like to say that for us to be able to do that, to grab a hold of that life, it was going to flash over there, but it's not going to anymore. I would like to present this morning that for us to be able to grab a hold of that full life, we want to live a gospel-worthy gospel -worthy life. And that is also the title of our sermon series for the month of September and the title of our sermon this morning. Gospel-worthy life. The scripture reading that was read today... Um, 
is what we are going to use to uh, delve into this particular topic this morning, specifically in Philippians 1, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I'm going to read that again. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, remember the last part of that is the gospel of Christ. We all understand that Jesus gave us an amazing amount of good news. That's the gospel. The good news was that Jesus came to earth, died on the cross for our sins, was buried to confirm that he actually died, that there was actually payment for our sins, and then finally he rose again. Because now we have a Lord that's not dead. We have a Lord that's alive. That's actually helping us today. And he did all that for our own sakes. We understand this. Because of that, we have salvation. But the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, which is our text this morning, admonishes us to do this. He, he says, live worthy lives. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of that sacrifice, of that good news. So this morning, as we delve deep into this particular verse, this one verse, we are going to ask and answer two questions. First, what does it mean to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? And number two, how do we do that today? Simple, um, the simple structure for our lesson this morning. Let's start. Conduct yourselves. What does conduct yourselves mean? It's a good, that's a good question, right? Conduct yourselves. Let us dig deep into that particular uh, phrase, conduct yourselves. Normally, the Apostle Paul would use uh, the word, uh, different words to like convey, uh, one particular word to convey something that pertains to our walk of life, to living to our manner, in the manner in which we live. That's literally what conduct yourselves really entails, is how do we live in this life, right? But he would use normally this term in, in all of his epistles. He would use the word to walk. I'm not going to even bother with the Greek because it's okay. It's called to walk, right? To walk. So here it is right here. Walking, Paul would use that word to, to be as a metaphor for living. Do you guys see that? So he would say, walk, but then when he says that, he admonishes us to live a certain way. That's in the New Testament. But in the New Testament, it's the exact same thing. The word, the Hebrew word, it's a different word, obviously, because it's Hebrew, it's called halak, and it's the same meaning. Walk as a metaphor for living. So there's so many examples in the Old Testament. And I know when I give you this example, you guys will go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I remember now. Psalm 1, verse 1. Do you guys remember that verse? Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Do you see, do you see that? He used the word halak, walk. The, psalm, the psalmist used the word walk to talk about how we live. Okay. The Apostle Paul did, this, uh, did the same thing in his epistles. And, and, and pretty much the other writers in the, the New Testament use the same thing as well. Use the walk, the word walk in Greek to talk about um, our, our, our walk of faith. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for example, we read, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Okay? So it's all over the scriptures. But here's, here's the clincher right here. The Apostle Paul used a different word in our text this morning. He didn't use the word to walk. Okay? The words conduct yourselves, one word in the Greek. It is the word, I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's, it's easier if you could see it there because then when I say it, you know exactly how it's spelled. Then it'd stick in your mind. But I would say it. It is polituomai. I'm pretty sure you guys remember that. You probably wrote it in your notes. But literally, that word means live as good citizens. 
That's the only time the Apostle Paul used that particular um, imperative verb in all of his epistles. This one right here in Philippians 1.27. Why would he do that? Why would he not use just the word to walk to signify living or a, way, or a Christian way of life? Well, the answer lies in what the city of Philippi was back in those days. Okay? The city is called Philippi, okay? not Philippines. You know, after this lesson, you won't, don't come to me and say, hey, you're from Philippi. You're Philippian. I'm Filipino. I'm not Philippian. <laughs> Philippi was in Greece. So if, for example, Canada is over there. This is the Mediterranean right here. Greece is right here. Philippi is when one of the coasts and Italy, where Rome, Rome is, is over here. Okay? But there's a special thing about Philippi. Do you guys know what it is? It was a Roman colony. How do we know that? We know that in Scripture, and we know that in history. In Acts 16, verse 12, we read, From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. What does it mean to be a Roman colony? It meant, literally, in this particular case in Philippi, a hundred years around before the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the, to the Philippians, the Roman government sent about 300 Ro uh, Roman army veterans to colonize or to, to, to live in Philippi to settle there. And that meant that these guys had citizenship and then more. They were able to also, as they, as they had descendants before them, although they were born in Philippi, in Greece, they would be Roman citizens. Isn't that great? They had the ability to, uh, they had the right to own property. They had the right to uh, sell property. They had, uh, one of the benefits that they had was they, they didn't pay income taxes. They didn't pay property taxes. That was one of the best things about being a, a Roman citizen in Philippi at the time. So why did Paul use the word citizen? Or literally that word citizen yourselves? That's literally what it meant, that verb. Citizen yourselves according to the gospel of Christ. Or live as good citizens. Because the apostle Paul wanted to relate his message extremely well to his audience to the people of Philippi. Because these individuals knew exactly what it was like to be a good citizen. Many of them, scholars tell us today, many of them in, the, in Philippi, even in the church, were not citizens. They want to, but they're not. But they understand what the benefits and the importance of being a Roman citizen and the benefits that went with it. So when Paul used that, they were like, oh, I know exactly what that meant. But here's the thing. Paul did not use that term to talk about their Roman citizenship. It alluded to it, but it alluded to something that's higher than their, Ro than their Roman citizenship. How do we know that? Because in our text, he said, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. He applied it to the gospel of Christ. Right? So, what does it mean to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy? The worthy manner. What does that mean? What does worthy manner mean? Right? What does that entail? Acceptable to God. Well, let's think about it this way. Like I was saying earlier, Paul applied it to something that's higher than their Roman citizenship. He applied it to their citizenship in heaven. And we know this because in Philippians 3, verse 20, we read that. But we are citizens of heaven. Like literally he said, uh, Paul said, but our citizenship is in heaven. He used the exact same word, but obviously with different endings. Because now it's a noun instead of a verb, right? First he said, citizen yourselves. But now in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. So here's what essentially he's telling the people of uh, Philippi. He's telling them, live 
in the Roman colony of Philippi as citizens of heaven. Now let's translate that to us today. Okay? Live as citizens of heaven in Winnipeg. That is the admonition for us today. That is the encouragement for us today. If there's one thing that you, 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 will, you, you need to take away from this lesson so far, is that live in Winnipeg as citizens of heaven. Now, the second part of our lesson is this. How do we do that? How do we do that today? Now, um, I also I went on Google and I typed the search uh, the, uh, on the search. I typed "best place to live in in, in the world" 2019. Okay, so the first there's this article which is the first hit. Okay, there was a study. It was on C CNBC dot, dot, dot com or dot CNBC dot com. There was a study by a U.S. Uh, like U.S. agency. I'm not sure. Ex I, I don't remember which uh, which uh, agency that ranked, you know, countries in the world for the top ten best country countries to live in the world. You know where Canada ended up? This is interesting. It's pretty oh, number one, number two, number ten, number fifteen, number three, number three. But here's the thing. Okay, rank number three. You look into the article, it tells you like the different criteria that they're judged by. Canada was the only country that got 10 out of 10 in this category called quality of life. And I'm like, why is Canada not number one? You know what I'm saying? Because they, they added stuff about like proximity to other countries, but you know, we're, we're, only, we're only like neighbors to like, you know, America, I guess, that's the United States. I guess that's one of the things that hit us. But that said, Canada, is, to me, is like number one in the world. It's like if, if your quality of life is 10 out of 10, and that's the only perfect score in all the countries that they ranked, it's 10 out of 10. It's number one in my books. Quality of life, way high in Canada. But I'll, I'll ask you this. Do you guys know people who still complain about Canada? Oh, yeah, you probably we complain about Canada. I sometimes complain about Canada. I sometimes complain about my life. Well, what's going on here? What is happening in Canada? I almost said that with a Canadian accent. What's going on here? Like you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I sometimes complain, but then I, I I wondered, why do I do that? Why do I or or why do we do that? Knowing that Canada is is literally the best, if, if one of the best, if not the best place to live in, on earth, why do we still complain that Canada, about things about Canada? Well, there's many answers to that, but I would like to share with you one reason I think that is. It's because some residents or citizens in Canada view their citizenship or resident status as a burden not a blessing. Do you guys want me to repeat that? I'll repeat that. I was going to write that up there, but you, there's none. So I'm going to say it again. Right? This is how I underline things now. I repeat it. Because there's no underlining anymore. I'm sad. <laughs> One of the reasons why I believe we still complain about Canada, although it's like literally one of the best countries to live in in the world, is because we see our resident status or our citizenship here in Canada as a burden, not a blessing. What do we mean by that? Sometimes we see our residence here or our citizenship here as, well, that means I have to pay taxes. I'm one of those guys. Why do we have not knowing that these taxes are probably one of the number one reasons why we are ranked number three in the polls, why we are the best place, we're one of the best places to live in Canada is because of the taxes. We fail to understand that these taxes benefit all of us, including me, including you. Right? Second, you know, last week, there's this one thing that we could do as citizens 
that we were able to exercise last week. Do you guys remember what it is? We were able to vote last week. I'm not going to ask you if you guys voted. I don't want to put you into that, in, in that position, right? But we were able to vote last week, right? But sometimes people uh, don't see Canada as the best place to live in because they think that voting, instead of a right, instead of a blessing, they look at that as a burden. Oh, man, I have to, like, research these guys now? I vote, or I have, I have to wake up early because it's a Tuesday. We vote on Tuesday. I think it's a Tuesday, September 10. We have to wake up early so I can, go, I can vote and then because I can't, I can't do it in the afternoon because I, I finished late that night. So I have to wake up early. Ah, come on. We look at it as a burden, not a blessing. Now you see where I'm going with this, right? We can apply that to our Christianity. We can apply that to our faith. We can apply that to the church. The reason why we are hindered by our ability to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ is because we see our faith, we see the church, we see our relationship with God as a burden and not a blessing. We see Christianity as just a list of expectations. Because I'm a member here, I'm a Christian. I have to go to church. And when I go to church, uh, I guess I have to put in an envelope. I have to like put in money in there somewhere. I have to attend this thing or that thing. I have to volunteer for that thing or that or this thing or the other. Brothers and sisters, if you're going to have a, a second takeaway from this lesson today is that for us to really be able to conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel of Christ. Is to view our faith as a blessing and not a burden. What makes a good citizen? Have you guys asked that question before? What makes a good citizen? Because Paul talked about it. He says, live as good citizens for the gospel. What does a good citizen do? You know, we have this concept, freedom and responsibility. I think I've talked to you about that. A good citizen understands their freedoms and rights and the responsibilities that come with, that free, with those freedoms and rights. And a good citizen enjoys, appreciates, and uses their rights and fulfills the responsibilities that they have in accordance with it. If I have the right to vote, I have the responsibility to make sure that I inform myself who to vote for according to my values and beliefs. That's the deal. Okay? But as Christians, sometimes we don't do that. We look at our, we look at our service, our Christianity as something that, well, it's a drag. Not realizing that being a Christian Serving God is the number one best thing that we can ever do in this world. It's, it's not better than Netflix. It's not better than, I know I'm old school, it's not better than uh, uh, Candy Crush. Or the Candy Crush, who plays that? Right? It's not better than, I don't know, like, it's not better than TV or, or hockey. I know, I know it's tough to say that. You're probably, what did you just say, Jay? It's not better than hockey. It is not. Oh, it, it, it is. God is better than hockey. What am I talking about? Okay? God is better than anything else in this world. We cannot see it as, as, as a burden. Okay? Um, and the way we do that is this. We should, we should as, as citizens of heaven, we need to understand our freedoms and respons- our freedoms and responsibilities, but more on thinking about the blessings that we have in Christ. Because when we really focus our minds and our hearts on the blessings that we have, the responsibilities follow. But if we just focus on our responsibilities, it's tough to make sense of that because it's it it it, it hurts, it it burns you out, right? It it, uh, it 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 makes you think, well, it's this is just too tiring. But if you think about it in a blessings point of view, it's amazing. We're here today, not because it's a job for us to be here today, because we want to be here today. 
It's a blessing for us to worship God and to learn from his words today. Okay? That is the thing. We need to use the blessings and the gifts that God has given us. That's the number one thing I can share with you this morning in terms of how to become the, the how, 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 to be, how, to, how to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Use the blessings that were given to us. How do we do that? Well, uh, I, I'll give you an illustration here. Have you guys, have you, how many of you guys have not received a gift card before? Gift cards. Have not. Nelson has not, but I think that's the only hand that I've received. I'm going to make sure that I give you a, a, a gift card at some point today. Maybe this week, all right? Everybody knows about gift cards, and most of us have received gift cards. Here's the next question. Have you guys, do you guys have, like, like, drawers in your house everywhere where there's, like, a, an APD? We have that all-purpose drawer. There's all your junk in there. Like, in the kitchen, I have an APD. All your junk goes in there. Your keys, your coins, whatever, right? Do you guys have those drawers in your house? The last time you checked your all-purpose drawer, wherever you keep your junk, you opened it. Do you guys see gift cards in there? Yes, you guys, the Barkers have. You guys have unused gifts in your drawers. You know what's crazy? Gift cards are the number one most wanted gifts ever in the whole world. And it's the most unused. So I looked this up. There's this website called finder.com. Had an article in there that says, this is in the States, Americans have left $45 billion, with a B, on unused gift cards. And then there's a tag in the bottom. The most requested gift can go unused for years. As Christians, God has given us so many gifts. You know one of them? Prayer. How many of us have used prayer to its full potential? It's there for the taking, but many don't use it. And therefore, many do not live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. It's not full because we have not used prayer. The next thing that we don't use much is here. The church. Depending on where we live, right? We need to use the church. You know, we don't have family here. We don't have biological relatives or family here in, in Manitoba, in Winnipeg. Well, in Western Canada, for that matter. But we have something better. We have you guys. We are our family is closer to you than my own, than in my own family. Some of you guys, my, my kids call grandma, grandpa. When I FaceTime my parents, they, they don't know who they are. I love them, but it's just the nature of things. I take advantage of the, of the fact that I have you here with me in, in Winnipeg. And I encourage you to do the same. But one of the things that we don't use enough of that God gave us is this. You guys ready? Our hope. Our hope. You know what our hope is in Christ? Our hope is that after this life is over, it doesn't matter what you're going through in this life. After this life is over, when you die, we will be with God in heaven. What is better than that? But we don't use that. Because when we have problems, we just focus our minds on the problem. Not our hope. Compared to that hope, our problems are this small. This is the reason why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Peter 1, 3-4, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. We have an inheritance. We have a living hope. We have joy in that hope. And this is why Christianity is not a burden. It's a blessing. Paul in 2 Corinthians said this, 2 Corinthians 4, 
But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And listen to this next thing that Paul says. We are hard-pressed on every side. Okay, you understand that? Hard-pressed. I appreciate Soren's prayer this morning. He talked about all of our problems and giving them to God. We are hard-pressed on every side. But Paul writes after that, but not crushed. We are hard-pressed, but we are not crushed. Why? Because we have our Heavenly Father in Heaven and our hope in Him. We are perplexed. Some of us here are like, why is this happening to me? Why am I still here in my point in my life? Why don't, have a better, why don't I have a better life? Why am I having this problem or that problem? Why am I having relationship problems now? We are perplexed. But Paul said, but not in despair. No despair. Because that's going to pass. And our hope is still secure there. He said, persecuted. I know in Canada, sometimes that happens. We are persecuted. We are ostracized. We are set aside for what we believe and what we practice. But Paul says, but not abandoned. And then finally, Paul said, we are struck down. Some of us are on the ground. Some of us, it seems that impossible for us to get up. But Paul said, we are not destroyed. See, this is the reason why Paul can say with all, with, with, with all certainty, he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, what should we do then? We should be careful to encourage all of us, to encourage one another to be good citizens. You know, instead of solving, solving each other's problems, because that breeds this idea of entitlement. If you know that Jay solves problems or those guys solve problems, we just always go to them. But if we teach each other to be good citizens, to help in the community, that will be more sustainable and more in line with what God wants us to do. To live lives in accordance with God's, with God's will. To, to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I saw an example of that yesterday. You know what yesterday was? Annual clothing giveaway. It started, I believe, Doug told me, told me 1996. Right? So that's what, 23 years. But apparently that's our number 24. Because one year, there were two giveaways. Is that correct? There were two giveaways one year. So yesterday was number 24. Next year is going to be number 25. Okay? So thank you to the, the weebs on that. Right? Richard and uh, uh, Wanda. Thank you. I know you're probably going, why did you mention my name, Jay? You shouldn't. But thank you for that. But yesterday, I saw this idea of helping one another be in community to be good citizens in heaven, in Winnipeg. Uh, do you guys know the Walters? Okay. Uh, uh, Donald and Laverne, and, and um, they, have, they have this uh, three-year-old boy. He, he sounds like he's five, but because he talks really well. Uh, Stefan, and I took a picture of him. I, I, I was supposed to have one here, but it, it doesn't work. But he, you know what he was doing? He was bringing the clothes outside for the giveaway. That was an encouragement to me. I want to do that for my kids too. But before I can do that to my kids, I need to do that for myself as well first. And that's the, that's the admonition that I have for all of us this morning. Live as good citizens in Winnipeg. So if you can stand and sing, we will sing our song of invitation this morning. <laughs>